We are back once again with those delightsome cartoons from the Jehovah's Witnesses, Caleb and Sophia. And we're going to be talking about an LGBT cartoon today. That is in line with this week's episodes. All five episodes this week, Monday through Friday, are going to have to do with the LGBT community. And joining me today is a former Jehovah's Witness called Telltale. Telltale, won't you say hello and tell the people a little bit about your channel? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, Generally, I do a lot of videos on extremism. I don't just appeal to atheists, although I am atheist myself. I address uh, extremist things. I address propaganda and cults and things like that. So uh, yeah, this is going to be pretty interesting. I'll warn you now, this one gets gross. I'm Mr. Atheist. And I'm Telltale. Let's do this. Now, Telltale, I have a tradition of doing this thing where I just cut in way, way too early. But I I do want to explain the sort of the context of what's going on here a little bit. Uh, uh, So basically, you have this is Sophia and Sophia is having a great time at school and they've drawn pictures of their family. I believe she's gone to retrieve hers. And now at how old do you think she is, Telltale? I think she's about 10. So now this 10 year old is depressed because she's just seen somebody else's picture of their family, which is uh, themselves and their two mommies. Man, that is just some really great indoctrination by 10 years old. Yeah, it's actually a, it's a very us versus them kind of thing that we're seeing here. You know, she's looking at this family. It's different from her family. And in a minute, we're going to get to see how her mom drives that difference home. So when you grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, how long, like at what age would you say you were already prepared to be repulsed by the concept of gay parents or gay people in general? You know, honestly, when I was little, um, I just knew it was wrong, period. Uh, You know, they talked about it a little bit from the podium and things like that, but they didn't hammer it home as hard as they are now. I mean, you, you know, I grew up in like the 1990s. Yep. This video was made just a few years ago. Uh, They're getting really extreme about some of this stuff. About this, about tight pants is a really big deal with them. You'd be surprised. Um, And things like that. So honestly, I was, you know, thinking back, I was actually kind of a little bit of a supporter um, because I didn't really understand, you know, 15 years old, 16 years old. I didn't understand how they were supposed to hate it as much as others did. So. I think my earliest memory of like homophobia, basically, I I must have been five or six because I I know the school I'm in at that point and it's in it's in southern Tennessee. So you can imagine. And I don't think it was as much at that time what the Mormons were saying about being gay, because, yeah, it still hadn't really become it, it hadn't jumped into the public so much as it did starting in like the early 2000s or even late 90s. But I do remember at some point. Uh, being in the bathroom, taking a poop and a kid jumping up and looking over the stall and me saying something like, if you do that, that means you're gay and thinking like, got him. Boy, did I. But uh, as far as it becoming like a religious issue, yeah, I think you're right. And I think this is happening more and more in, in all of these very culty religions or perhaps just religion in general, really trying to start younger almost as like a defense mechanism against like, if we start younger, maybe our kids won't turn out gay. Good luck with that. Look, Mom. I drew our family in school today. Oh, wow. I didn't have time to finish Caleb's face. (laughs) Carrie drew two mommies. Real quick on the Caleb's face thing. Are the Jehovah's Witnesses amongst them that can't have like face cards or like dolls with faces because of vanity? Or is that just like... No, no, no. They're okay with that. Um, Yeah, that that hasn't really been an issue with Jehovah's Witnesses. I was thinking about this like, you know, this video is a piece of propaganda and it's given to children and pretty much everything in it is there for an intended purpose. 
It yeah. adds to the ambiance in some way or something. So I was thinking to myself, is there something to this face thing? I don't think so. I think it's just kind of a lead up to the story to give them some, you know, something to yeah. think about. But everything's just light and fun. In in Mormonism, there is there is like a debate. At least there was when I exited about why we were prohibited face cards for years and years, and they kind of got over it. But uh, there was the vanity angle. But then others were, especially later on, being like, no, it's actually a gambling principle. You see, the prophet's new gambling was an addiction. So I was wondering if if maybe there was... Super fascinating. So what is this bit about face cards? Like, what are face cards? Yeah, I forget that people wouldn't just <laughs> use that term. Uh, face cards would be like a deck of cards that the Jack, Queen, King, and or Joker have faces. You could have cards that just said J with a diamond, but if it had a picture... That wasn't okay. That is so fat. I had no idea. I've got to pick your brain on this for real. Let's watch this totally non bigoted nonsense. She told me they're married to each other. My teacher says that all that matters is that people love each other and that they're happy. Hmm. Well, people have their own ideas about what is right and wrong. People have different ideas about what is right and wrong. That's true. But there is an objective answer about what we can do to make society better. There is an objective answer about the best thing to do for human well-being, okay? So we may not know that answer all the time, but there is an objective answer to be had. The fact that Jehovah's Witnesses here are saying something like, people have their own ideas about what's right and wrong, is kind of implying that people, it's up for debate whether or not this thing is right or wrong, whether this thing is good for society or not. Yeah. And of course, they're now going to take a position as though there is an objective moral authority that has set this down because we as humans might want to debate about it, but there's some greater authority. However, what I liked is is just the way she goes, hmm, well... It's funny how when they're presenting on the outside publicly, like, look at the really respectful way we are doing this, when in reality, behind the doors, I mean, I can speak from the Mormon end, it's it's met with much more vitriol. And in this case, like, I've talked about a lot on my channel, the way with a smile on in their face, a person will tell you you're trash. And it just seems like that's what it was behind the, hmm, well, people have their own, basically like, hmm, well, what an ignorant bitch your teacher is. Let me explain. But what matters? matters is how Jehovah feels. He wants us to be happy, and he knows how we can be happiest. That's why he invented marriage the way he did. Yeah, yeah this is why he invented marriage the way he did, right? Um, so their whole morality is based off of the idea that the Bible is the final moral authority. I don't consider the Bible my final moral authority. I'm sorry, you, you shouldn't. That is just wrong to do, whether you're religious or not. You should consider human well-being the gauge for whether or not you should do something. Is this going to hurt people should be the gauge, right? She mentioned that uh, Jehovah invented marriage this way, but marriage precedes Christianity. Yeah, by like a far gap. Yeah, it's, it's not insignificant. You mean one man and one woman? Exactly. Look at Genesis 127. Jehovah created Adam and Eve, male and female. And if this was in an actual home, teaching actual principles, it wouldn't have been so kind and nice. She definitely would have ended that with, and not Adam and Steve. I just know it. <laughs> exactly. Not, not just that, but think about this. Um, doesn't the Bible mention in like a billion different places that these leaders that God so loved had like multiple wives and concubines mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. Why is it one man and one woman when it's convenient for them? Right. Solomon and David got to have lots of extramarital affairs or even Abraham got to take his handmaiden. So it's, it's one man and one woman. Wink. Then in Genesis 2 24, he said that a man will stick to his wife. Later, Jesus said the same thing. Jehovah's standards haven't changed. Jehovah's standards haven't changed, they said. Did you did you catch that? I did. Jehovah's standards have not changed. But, you know, like we said a second ago, we were just talking about how so many different people in the Bible had multiple wives. and I mean, polygamy was endorsed forever. So either his, either his standards don't change or they do. Which is it? You can't have it both ways. It's the bottom line. So Jehovah's standards never change, but... For you, the audience, I'd like to present to you this colorful graphic 
of every time the Bible contradicts itself. I'm pretty sure this is a conservative estimate. It's kind of like going on an airplane. What would happen if someone wanted to bring something on the plane that wasn't allowed? They can't go on the trip. Right. It's the same with Jehovah. He wants us to be his friend and live in paradise forever. And because in this case, they are saying that the plane is Jehovah's. It's not your plane. You can take whatever you want on your plane. Essentially, what I'm saying is Jehovah doesn't give a shit about your happiness. He gives a shit about your obedience. So regardless of how difficult that makes your life or potentially unbearable, and we see how these sorts of ideas and thoughts play out in, in states like Utah, where they have very, with a smile on their face, homophobic ways about teaching kids these things. And that's why you have a super high LGBT suicide rate in Utah. Yeah, not just that, but uh, Jehovah, it doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about his happiness right? He cares about what makes him happy. He wants you to do that for him. And if you don't, then he will kill you. That's the bottom line. Very um, literally. It, yes. I mean, it, the Bible says birds are going to eat the dead bodies after the genocide God commits. Seriously, do people actually read this? I mean, the only way that it, it seems, the only reason it seems as tame and nice and heartfelt and happy as it does is because that's what you get from the lens of your childhood. That's the way your parents framed it for you. When you read it outside of the context that your parents provided for you, you can tell that this is just a horrific, disgusting story. And on that note, one more thing. You can't just drop your gay off uh, at the metal detector. It does not work that way. <laughs> what if I drop off a lot of gay things at the metal detector? but we have to follow his standards to get there. At Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it talks about the road leading to paradise. To get there, Jehovah says we have to leave some things behind. That means anything Jehovah doesn't approve of. I mean, this is just adding to that whole, Jehovah is worried about his happiness, not about your happiness thing. He doesn't give a shit if you're happy or not. He gives a shit if you're obedient. And it so well caters to the people who are in power. As with most of these religions, they are led by men who are interested in perpetuating their own power. So when they're talking about, you just have to drop it off, acting like it's this arbitrary, easy thing, this is commandments coming from men who still got to get sexual fulfillment out of their life, but get to tell others, like, listen, that's your sin, that's your thing to drop off, but you got to drop it off, as though they can even conceptualize how simple that is when they are getting laid. Exactly right. Not just that, but uh, if they really wanted to, they, they probably could conceptualize it by just thinking to themselves, what if I woke up one day and everybody around me expected me to like guys? You know, what, what if I woke up one day and my family disowned me and I couldn't get a job and, and all of this stuff because I had a girlfriend? They could conceptualize it if they wanted. If it was, if they were willing to look at it through that light. I think sometimes, because I've definitely approached religious people with those kinds of hypotheticals, and they'll act like they're taking it on honestly. But again, it's, it's a matter of like, you're trying to entertain a hypothetical, but until you're in that position, you can't really. Because a lot of times you will get back, if that is what God wanted of me, that is what I would do. I've even gone with like Mormons, like extreme examples of like, what if your prophet tomorrow decided to bring back Nazism? Because you just do what the prophet says and you worry about whether or not he was wrong later. Because now they are addressing that uh, that that the prophets have been very wrong in the past and that that was the times they were working as men, not as actual prophets, which makes the whole thing completely arbitrary and stupid. But uh, basically they were like, yeah, I would do it. And, and I would I would trust that God, if he if the prophet was getting it wrong, that God would understand I was doing the best I could with his prophet. But I have a feeling if that actual situation happened, you'd have a totally different line of behavior. So it's totally disingenuous as is this thing of the one man, one woman. You know, good on the Jehovah's Witnesses for attacking lesbians this time. Usually the go-to is attacking gay men. Uh, so at least they're a little more diverse in their bigotry. You're exactly right. Conceptualizing something and, and actually finding yourself in that position, they're two different things. Yep. And until you find yourself in that position, you can't really 
understand the the kind of situation or the kind of things that go through your mind. And at that point, I think the best approach is to accept that, that I can't really understand. So I should come at this with the most empathy I can muster, but also the understanding that I have no idea what this person is going through. And I think that leads to a better world, but it leads to a world with a little less Christiness in it. But I want everyone to get to paradise. So does Jehovah. And you know what? People can change. That's why we share his message. This is seriously disgusting, isn't it? Like, just look at what's happening here. People can change. This is the height of propaganda. Uh, It's this us versus them attitude. They want everybody to be just like them. Jehovah wants everybody to make it into paradise. But really, does he? Because if that was what he wanted, then they would be there, right? Right. Doesn't he have the key? It isn't, isn't it his airport, his airplane? Doesn't he control who gets in? Why? Why all this extra stuff? If you really want everyone there, come up with a better plan. Exactly. This is just disgusting. I mean, this is heartbreaking that they're showing this to children between the ages of four and 14. I mean, there's somebody sitting in their living room right now watching this. Right. And thinking like, you know, I felt bad about hearing about Todd who had to go off to gay conversion therapy, but I'm realizing it's not so bad here. And that's what really fucking gets under my skin with this stuff is people can change. A lot of times you can't. There are lots of things about yourself that you cannot change. Or if you do change it, you didn't do so in a healthy way because there's definitely things like chemical castration, which we now look back at as one of the terrible ideas we had for treating the gay. And this is what is encouraging families like this to go, oh, I have a gay son, rather than try to get to know him, try to understand he's the same person, try to realize that his love is the same kind of love, I'd rather just go have him fucked up because in the end, what's important is that we are all in paradise together. This paradise that I really don't have a good reason to believe actually exists, except for that it gives me comfort to know that I'm going there to know. And like the psychopath that religion often turns into people, I also delight in the idea of being right and getting to laugh at all of the people who are wrong compared to me. So what can you say to Carrie? Well, I could tell her about the paradise. I could tell her about the animals and the resurrection. This was me as a kid. And I look back and I think how fucking gross it was. But I remember we actually had in our neighborhood in Florida, a kid that everyone called Scooter. I can't remember what his real name was. And he had two moms. And we thought it was our place at nine years old to tell him about how his moms are living in sin and how that's not okay and that's not what God wants. It empowers children who don't know what the fuck they are talking about. They have no idea the depth of this issue to just oversimplify it and take it to a place of, no, you you look. I understand that blah, blah, blah. I mean, and we weren't so kind as this because people aren't. uh, And it's not really kindness. It's passive aggressiveness. But yeah, we thought it was our place as children who didn't understand the issue to dictate to adults the way they should be living their lives. And it's such a fucking disgusting way to go about living. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Not just that, but earlier you were talking about gay conversion camp or gay conversion therapy. That is is another subject that needs to be covered heavily. That is really, really fucked up. But this is adding to a climate of, uh, you know, it's it's encouraging children to to view this as wrong. It's adding to this climate of, you know, try to change them. Make sure that these kids know that their parents are living in sin, even if their parents were living in sin. Even if sin was a real thing in the first place, why is it this kid's place to tell this other kid what his parents are doing wrong? They don't know anything about the situation. They don't know these parents. They don't know these kids, honestly. Why is it their place to talk about this at all? I could tell her about the animals and the resurrection. That's awesome. Let's practice. Right. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. So awesome. Let me tell you, this girl's mom killed my resurrection. When I was younger, my mom did a lot of this stuff too, where you saw her push the Bible over to her, 
talk about studying it. Let's practice all this stuff. Jehovah's Witnesses are really big on practicing and preparing. They have a plethora of literature that you're supposed to study constantly. The Watchtower and The Awake and the numerous books that you're supposed to read and the kingdom ministry and any number of other things that you're supposed to keep up with every week. Is it any wonder why Jehovah's Witnesses are worn down and tired and ready to just accept what they're told? This is one of the tactics that cults use to keep people brainwashed. They get them worn down and tired so they're more willing to accept what they hear. Yeah, absolutely. How are you going to have doubts if you don't have any time for doubts? And especially if you actually then start shaming people on top of that for doubts. That's my theory on why Mormons go to church so much. Now, they've just changed it. But growing up, I went to three hours of service on Sunday. And often there would be something extra you had to do on Sunday. Monday through Friday, I went to an hour of seminary. Wednesday nights, I went to a two-hour activity for young men and young women. And about twice a month, you would also see a Saturday activity. And during all of these, you're just hearing, this is the truth, and this is why you shouldn't have doubts, and this is why you should stand strong, and why you should be a beacon and an example, which is a dog whistle for just accept it and say it. And everyone is faking it until they make it. But you will think you're the only one faking it and that all of these people's testimonies are actually strong and you aspire to be as strong. And it's it's funny how it's the same tactics one to another. But people in these cults and in these religions don't look at others and feel at all bothered by the fact that all these other people with totally contradictory beliefs believe with the same level of confidence that they know it's true, looking out at that, that should be what bothers a person. That's what should trigger your skepticism and your cognitive faculties to go, okay, if they're just as sure and they've used the same exact methods to get to their truth as I've used to get to my truth, how do we tell the difference? How do we tell which one of us is correct? But the problem with a lot of these is you're not even allowed to express or think maybe I could be wrong. And that is a really dangerous way to think about anything. Fascinating to look at these groups' literature, their, uh, their videos that they put out and things like that, and actually see them teaching their members thought-stopping techniques and teaching them loaded language and cliches. These are things that you can find on the bite model, the model we use to determine if something is a cult or not. I, I, I'm wondering if they even know that this model exists and that they hit every point on it, seriously. I know with Mormons, when you approach them with it, they then go with the like, they find a parallel to every single point that they can point at. At They like to pick on Catholicism, especially uh, as like, well, really, if that's the definition of a cult, all religions are cults. And sure, we have a, a church leader because Jesus Christ is all of our church's leader and totally ignoring the actual context of all of those points. So yeah, they try to make the whole thing arbitrary and, and as a way to build themselves up. Because what is more supportive to religion than things you can just arbitrarily reinterpret. We are going to leave it there for today. Telltale, why don't you tell the people where they can find you? And just so everyone knows, there's also going to be links down below as, as well as a little icon here at the end. Yeah, you can find me on my YouTube channel at Telltale. You can also find me, i uh, been doing a podcast lately where I read from extremist literature. I have read from ISIS propaganda called Dabiq. I, right now I'm going through the Jehovah's Witnesses brand new book called Pure Worship of Jehovah. It's kind of interesting. I also talk to guests and things like that. But yeah, my main channel is Telltale and I do a lot of dissections of cults on there and extremism and things like that. So check it out. Here are a couple of buttons for you. The top one is a video from Telltale's channel that I really like. And the bottom one is a button that you can subscribe directly to Telltale from. The rest of this list here are my patrons who I cherish so much for their contribution to the channel. A special thank you to my orbital teapots, Anika and Carissa, and today's patron of the day, who is Lacey York. Lacey, thank you so much. With love, I've been Jimmy. Mr. Atheist wasn't my father.